we're going to start today with character 23. We're almost done with the characters. I warned you of this. I'll continue my warnings that this is the boring part. We got to get through this part. We can get into reading the stories. How many people do want? Seven? Seven or eight. We're on 23. <clears throat> okay, so character 23 is the wife of Bath. Bath is a city. It's almost like you could call this lady um, the lady from Bath, okay? So don't get the wife of Bath to like mix up in your head. She's a bathing lady? No, Bath no. is just the name of the town, town where she lives. But what does she do though? 24, you're gonna find out. Wait, I thought we were on 23. What happened 23? Page 24, Pilgrim 23. The wife of Bath. There was a housewife come from Bath, or near, who, sad to say, was deaf in either ear. At making cloth, she had so great a bent, she bettered herself, she bettered those of the oppressed and even of Ghent. In all the parish, there was no good wife should offering make before her on my life. And if one did, indeed, so wroth was she, it put her out of all her charity. Her kerchiefs were of finest weave and ground. I dare swear that they weighed a full ten pounds, which, of a Sunday, she wore on her head. Her hose were of the choicest scarlet red, close garter, and her shoes were soft and new. Bold was her face, and fair, and red of hue. She'd been respectable throughout her life, with Five church husbands bringing joy and strife, not counting other company in her youth. But there, uh, there's no need to speak in truth. Three times she journeyed to Jerusalem, and many a foreign stream she'd had to send. At Rome she'd been, and she'd been in Boulogne, in Spain at Santiago, and at Cologne. She could tell much of wandering by the way. Gap tooth was she. It is no lie to say. Upon an ambler easily she sat, well wimpled eye, and all over, and over all a hat, as broad as is a buckler or a targe. A rug was tucked around her buttocks large, and on her feet a pair of spurs quite sharp. In company, well could she laugh and carp. The remedies of love she knew perchance, for of that Art, she learned the old, old dance. So she's been very many places, had five husbands. Okay, so let's so start at the beginning. Dead. First thing, she's, she's dead. dead. Second thing, dead. what's her profession? Sewer. Yeah, weaver. And how good is she? Very good. Very good. Better than people from like Asia, the Orient, like the Far East. The people that are like known for their cloth making, she is that good. Like her. Um, fabric is comparable to those people. Okay, she is wealthier, poor, or middle class? She's like middle. She's middle, like middle maybe upper middle. She's traveled a lot, so she's been on a lot of pilgrimages, even to Jerusalem, which is like the most holy um, pilgrimage site which implies that she has both money and time to travel. Okay, she has five church husbands. What does that mean? Uh, they either died or... They had to have died. Because oh, otherwise... Okay. Divorce wasn't a thing. You, this she would still be married to the first one. So she's had five That's husbands. The they didn't have divorce. Like, nope, because they're Catholic. There's no divorce. We haven't we haven't gotten to Henry the Eighth yet when we find out about divorce, so And that fifth husband should be afraid. <laughs> the fifth husband should be afraid. Okay, at the very bottom it describes um what her tale is gonna be about, which we are gonna read her story. What's her tale gonna be about? What's her area of expertise? No? Marriage. Making cloth. Marriage. Love. It says, 
The remedies of love she knew perchance, for of that art she learned the old, old dance. So her story is going to be about love, marriage, relationships. She should know. She's had five husbands. Okay? More experience. So remember, um, in the pyramid, the feudal pyramid, Basically, the only way that a woman can have any rights is if she's a widow. She has a lot of rights. But she, but she has, but she chose to remarry, which implies that she either liked the subordination, like she liked that not being in control, or she really fell in love five times. Okay, number 24, the parson. Or she just really wanted money. <laughs> and it says, uh, 144, a local priest whose job was to tend to the spiritual needs of people. So this person is similar to a friar, except friars Are homeless. spend a lot of time in the monasteries, like with the monks, and parsons were more out and about traveling around with people. Okay. There was a good man of religion, too, a country parson, poor, I warrant you. But rich he was in holy thought and work. He was a learned man, also a clerk, who Christ's own gospel truly sought to preach. Devoutly his parishioners would he teach. Benign he was and wondrous diligent, patient in adverse times, and well content as he was oft times proven. Always blithe, he was right loath to curse to get a tithe, but rather would he give in case of doubt unto those poor parishioners about part of his income, even of his goods, enough with little colored all his moods. Okay, so what kind of minister is he? A good one. A good one. Like what does he do? He gets to the Takes from his own meager income and uses it to help others. Help others. Be very humble. Yeah, giving. I'm on line 15. Wide was his parish, houses far asunder, but never did he fail for rain or thunder, in sickness or in sin or any state. To visit the smallest, to visit the farthest, small and great, going afoot and in his hand a stave. This fine example to his flock he gave. That first he wrought, and afterward he taught. Out of the gospel, then that text he caught, and this figure he added thereunto. Okay, so he's going to give some examples. These are the little mottos that he lives by. That if gold rust, what should poor iron do? For if the priest be foul in whom we trust, what wonder if a layman yield to lust? And shame it is, if priests take thought for keep, a shitty shepherd shepherding clean sheep. Well ought a priest example good to give by his own cleanness how his flock should live. Okay, so... Two metaphors or similes, kind of, I don't know, metaphors. So the first is that if gold, the greatest of all the iron ores, will rust, that means him, he's the gold, what could his parishioners be expected to do? So if he can turn bad, what hope is there that the people he ministers could be good? None. Okay? So if gold would rust, that's him, what would poor iron do? And then the second is about the shepherd and the sheep. That if you want to be a good shepherd, if you want to have good sheep, you must also be a good shepherd. Good shepherd. That a dirty shepherd will yield dirty sheep. So two metaphors there. Sim um, metaphors that are symbols of the motto that he lives his life by. So he has to be the best example. 
I'm on line 31 now. He never let his benefice for hire, leaving his flock to flounder in the mire, and ran to London up to old St. Paul's to get himself a chantry there for souls, nor in some brotherhood did he withhold, but dwelt at home and kept so well the fold that never wolf could make his plans miscarry. He was a shepherd and not a mercenary. Okay, so some other people who kind of have jobs like him, they would run into town to buy those relics, those um, religious relics, those artifacts, and then sell them to people, or they would hole up in a monastery. He doesn't do that. He stays out in the towns working with his people. That's his only job. That's what he does. And holy though he was and virtuous, to sinners he was not impetuous, nor haughty in his speech, nor too divine, but in all teachings prudent and benign. To lead folk into heaven but by stress of good example was his business. But if some sinful one prove obstinate, be who it might of high or low estate, him he reproved, and sharply as I know, there is nowhere a better priest I trow. He had no thirst for pomp or reverence, nor made himself a special spiced conscience. But Christ's own lore and his apostles twelve, he taught. But first, he followed it himself. The plowman. So it says 151, the side note, supposed to represent a typical commoner. So the plowman kind of represents most of the manual laborers, people who just kind of go and do a job. With him, there was a plowman, so traveling. With the parson. With him there was a plowman, was his brother. Then many a load of dung, and many another had scattered for a good, true toiler he, living in peace and perfect charity. So not only are they traveling together, they are brothers. He loved God most, and that with his whole heart at all times, though he never played or plied his art, and next his neighbor, even as himself. He threshed and digged with never thought of pelt. For Christ's own sake, for every poor white, all without pay, if it lay in his might. He paid his taxes fully, fairly well, both by his own toil and by stuff he'd sell. In a tavern, he rode upon a mare, and then it's telling him the rest of the people that are there. He ran out of things to say and needed to get the rhyme in, so he just throws in some lines at the end there. He has a horse. Okay, what do we know about this guy? He's got a horse, he's a brother, he's a parson, he pays his taxes. Never thought of one. Christian man. Good Christian man, hard worker, does his job, pays his bills, lives his life for God. 26. The miller. Okay, what would the job of a miller be? Make a grower. Okay, so there's different types of mills. There are like sawmills and grain mills. So this would be a grain mill. So here's what would happen. People like the plowman would harvest their grain crop and then they would take it into town to a miller and he would weigh it and then he would grind it and sometimes he would return it to them, right? So that you can make your own whatever you're making with your grains. There was a lot of opportunity for corruption in the miller's business. Like, if your scales weren't... Anybody... 
Deer, deer hunting. Anybody deer hunters in here? So you ever, or even with cattle. Like you take your cow into the butcher shop and then when you get it back, you get like a third of what you take in or maybe a quarter of what you take in, right? And some of the weight, like your hanging weight versus your return weight is obviously in the parts of the animal that aren't edible. Bones, fat, stuff like that. Some organs that you don't usually eat. But can you be cheated by a butcher? Probably. Would you know? Probably not. I mean, you could like calculate it, but it would be very difficult. Because you took a little bit, you wouldn't know. If you weren't there, you don't know how much fat was actually on that animal, right? If you weren't there when it was clean, you wouldn't know that. So they do meat instead. Yes. Yeah, so they mill wheat, flour, rye, some kind of grain. And there's a lot of corruption in this industry. And so this would be a stereotype that people during this time period would have known. So you need to know it also so that you can get what he's saying about me. Okay, the Miller is one of my favorite characters. His story is hilarious. I'm not gonna read it, but it is good. Well, somebody's gonna read it probably, but not as a class. Okay, the Miller was a stout churl and it says, a rude, coarse man. Be it known, hardy and big of brawn and big of bone, which was well proved. For when he went on lamb at wrestling, never failed he of the ram. He was a chunky fellow, broad of build. He'd heave a door from hinges if he will, or break it through by running with his head. So this guy is like a. Bronze, old ram. Yeah. Big, <coughs> big old dude. Okay? His beard, as any sow or fox, was red, and broad it was as if it were a spade. Upon the coping of his nose, he had a wart, and thereon stood a tuft of hairs, red as the bristles in an old sow's ears. His nostrils, they were black and very wide, a sword and buckler bore he by his side. His mouth was like a furnace door for size. He was a jester and could poetize, but mostly all of sin and revolveries. He could steal corn and full thrice charge his fees. And yet he had a thumb of gold, begad. A white coat and blue hood he wore, this lad. A bagpipe he could blow well, be it known. And with that same, he brought us out of town. Okay, what should you write? Red, chunky. Okay. He has a, he has a beard. He's a big old. And he's kind of like a cheater because like he puts his thumb on his tail. Okay. Beard. He is. He practices the cheating he's that not Millers really were known a for. Kind of not a virtuous kind of person. If you go out to the bar after a day's work with him, he's the guy sitting around telling dirty stories the whole time, making everybody laugh and blush. He's a redhead, red beard, got a wart on his nose with a bunch of red hair sticking out. Number 27, the manciple, 159, it says, someone who purchased supplies for a school or monastery. So he's like a clerk, um, kind of like a, another version of a secretary, a different type of secretary. He works at like a bed and breakfast kind of thing where rich people stay. There was a manciple from an inn of court to whom all buyers might quite well resort to learn the art of buying food and drink. For whether he paid cash or not, I think, that he so knew the market when to buy, 
he never found himself left high and dry. So good at his job? Yes. Yes. So he's the food and beverage orderer for this inn, this bed and breakfast hotel kind of thing where he works. And he's good. He knows when things are going to be on sale or he has just like this knack for buying. Now, is it not of God a full fair grace that such a vulgar man has wit to pace the wisdom of a crowd of learned men? Of masters, he had more than three times ten who were in law expert and curious. Whereof there were a dozen in that house, fit to be stewards of both rent and land, of any lord in England who would stand upon his own and live in manner good, in honor, debtless, save his head were wood, or live as frugally as he might desire. These men were able to have helped a shire in any case that might befall. And yet this manciple outguessed them all. Okay, so that little passage there, what I just read, is describing the type of men he works for. He should, all these men should be smarter than him. But he is better. So is it luck? Is it natural instinct or intuition? Even trained men aren't as good as he is at the job he does. Twenty-eight. This will be the last one for today. And um, number twenty-eight is the reeve, and it says an official in charge of overseeing a large estate. In my mind, this guy is like the go-between, <coughs> kind of like a butler um, or a secretary for a lord, like a duke. So, say you're a duke, and you're spending all your time in London, and you have a vassal back home running things, the reed is the go-between, you and your vassal. He's the guy that's running messages and So he's just the errands. between the vassal and the lord? So he's sort of like above the vassal, but he's not actually doing the work the vassal is doing. Make sense? Okay. The reeve, he was a slender, choleric man who shaved his beard as close as razor can. His hair was cut round, even with his ears. His top was tonsured like a pulp tears. Long were his legs, and they were very lean, and like a staff, with no calf to be seen. Well could he manage granary and bin. No auditor could ever on him win. He could foretell by drought and by the rain the yielding of his seed and of his grain. His lord's sheep and his oxen and his dairy, his swine and horses, all his stores, his poultry, were wholly in this steward's managing. And by agreement, he'd made reckoning since his young lord of age was twenty years. Yet no man ever found him in arriers. Okay, so he has a lot of responsibilities for his lord. Why is that? Because he took his lord took over when he was young. And so this Reeve had to kind of help him navigate his new title as a young man. And he's very good at his job. Okay. How do we know he's not the one out there doing the work? Because he's a tiny guy. His legs are like toothpicks. They're so thin you can't even tell where bone is the cap starts. His calf, like he doesn't even have a defined calf muscle, it's like just a stick. Okay? There was no agent, hind, or herd who cheat, but he knew well his cunning and deceit. They were afraid of him as of the death. His cottage was a good one on a heath, by green trees shaded this dwelling place. Much better than his lord could he purchase. 
Right rich he was in his own private right, seeing he pleased his Lord by day or night, by giving him or lending him of his goods, and so got thanked, but yet got coats and hoods. In youth he learned a good trade, and had been a carpenter, as fine as could be seen. This steward sat a horse that well could trot, and was all dapple gray, and was named Scott. A long surcoat of blue did he parade, and at his side he bore a rusty blade. Of Norfolk was this reeve of whom I tell, from near a town that men call Bade Swell. Bundled he was like friar from chin to croup, and ever he rode hindmost of our troop. Okay, so no one will ever cheat him or try to take advantage of him. Because if they do, what happens? He'll get them back. He'll get them back. Like, people are afraid of him. So he must have a reputation for being hard on the people who he... Like a personal trainer. Doesn't like. Maybe not. Okay. Any questions? So he owes you money for this? No, he makes a lot of money. Where what line made you think that? One sixty three on his side where it says all his money. So it says no man ever found him owing money. Oh. Like when the the when he does the books for his lord, they never end up owing anyone money. Okay, those of you who will be gone tomorrow...